Gone with the Wind, adjusted for inflation, the highest grossing film in American history, has undergone several critical reappraisals in the 82 years since its production and release. Certainly, the film romanticizes the antebellum South and the Confederacy, while glossing over the evils of slavery and stereotyping many of its black characters. But it may also provide a sharp critique or even satirization of its white characters, the ambivalent, arrogant, and deluded plantation owners who fail to acknowledge that their so-called fairy tale kingdoms are built on the backs of slaves. What can we make of Rhett Butler's characterization of the Confederate cause as the cause of living in the past? And why does even the modern, adaptable Scarlett O'Hara remain in thrall to a childhood dream that, like the gallantry of the Old South, was nothing more than a fantasy? These are the topics for today's discussion. This is Aaron Alonik. And this is Wes Alwyn. And you're listening to Subtext. Wes, I am so happy that we are finally doing Gone with the Wind. I feel like I have referenced this film in so many other episodes that we've done. Obviously, this movie has an important place in film history. There's a lot to love about it. There's a lot that's controversial, which I'm sure we'll get to over the course of our discussion. But just to give a little personal background, I think you and I have both talked about how we grew up watching Wizard of Oz and we don't remember the first time we saw it. But I really strongly remember the first time I saw Gone with the Wind. It was Thanksgiving. I was six or seven years old. And as the family was gathering around the table, they were talking about how Gone with the Wind was going to be airing on TV that night. And maybe that was something that we could do later was watch it. Hmm. I had heard of this movie before, and I thought it was a James Bond movie based on the title. <laughs> <laughs> and I was... It is, a good, it is a good title for Right? Like Bond. it kind of, that kind of makes sense. So I was really confused as to why so many people in my family who professed varying levels of interest in James Bond movies were so adamant about the fact that we should all sit and watch this. Anyway, I was I was very confused, very curious. And um, it started and I, I obviously soon realized it was not a James Bond movie. And uh, <laughs> I was so captivated by it. I thought it was so beautiful. And I, I was just in love with Vivian Lee. And I, I thought it was such an incredible experience that I asked for it from Santa for Christmas. And I got the two VHS double set and, <laughs> and, mm. wa- and watched that double set pretty much every Saturday afternoon for the next, I want to say three, three and a half years wow. until I had worn out the tape. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I had in my, I, I, it, I just remembered this this morning in my freshman dorm in school, I had a poster of Rhett and Scarlet embracing over my bed in my, in my freshman dorm room. Wow. Yeah. So this and Wizard of Oz were, were probably the two er texts of my, of my childhood and adolescence. Hmm, very um, different. <laughs> er I know. Well, and that's, uh, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure, yet, sure if their similar. relationship is such a good uh, model for, for a young, <laughs> I know for young mind. <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, it occurred to me later how, how dangerous it was for me to be so obsessed <laughs> with this film. Believe me, I know, but I'm glad we're getting two different flavors here because you just watched this film for the first time, which I find so sad <laughs> just a couple of weeks ago, right? Yeah, I also vividly remember the first time I saw this film <laughs> because it was a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and my second time was just this morning. So last night and this morning, I did my second viewing with note taking. So this is really the two ends of the spectrum in terms of perspective. It is. I was excited to see this just because we were coming out of a streetcar named Desire and I thought it would be interesting to see another Vivian Lee movie. And because I hadn't seen it and it's, it's, it's an important movie to see and I was finally going to get to see it. You know, I honestly didn't think I was going to do two viewings, um, especially because it's three and a half hours. I thought I would approach this more casually, but I ended up doing the second viewing and taking lots of notes. So I was really impressed, especially by the visual aspect of the, the mm-hmm. film, the cinematography, the use of these often silhouettes against a so for instance her, scarlet and her father standing against a red sky the whole thing with the red sky or, or and people you know whether it's a sunset or the, the burning of the atlanta depot and mm-hmm. seeing figures 
cast against that. There's a lot of attention to the aesthetics of the film, which is appropriate to everything that's going on thematically. It's appropriate artistically to think about that. The, the visual lushness of the film, of course, is also related to the kinds of ideals involved in the Old South, it's sort of the notion of gentility and the emphasis on appearances, Scarlett's interest in looking beautiful and wearing beautiful dresses and hats and living on a, on a beautiful plantation, all of those things. The film leans into all of that stuff, which I think um, gives it the unfair reputation of actually glorifying its subject matter when there's lots of evidence against that. Absolutely. I completely agree. I think that the film is so much smarter about its source material and about the way that it's portraying certain things than people tend to give it credit for. It's been a long time since I've read the novel, I should say, but I have read it a couple of times. And I think that the novel is also more critical of the South than people give it credit for. And there's a lot in this that is anachronistic, though it does a pretty good job of in terms of costuming and and reproducing everything very meticulously. It does a, a great job at that. But a lot of people have argued, for instance, that Scarlet is, uh, I think Ebert said this in his review, and other people have noted this, that Scarlet is more of a, um, a Depression era heroine than a Civil War or Reconstruction era heroine. She gets away with a lot more than she would have ordinarily in that society. We could talk about whether or not that in itself is providing a sort of anachronistic model of an alternative way to be in this particular world. The, the visual beauty, I'm, I'm a couple of times when I was watching this time around, and I, I really do have almost the whole movie memorized, I'm sure, even shot for shot in my head. And, and, and still, I'm just struck by certain moments where you can pause it and it looks like a, like a painting. Mm -hmm. The one frame of the carriage going on that sort of perilous route to back to Terra after Rhett has abandoned mm -hmm. Scarlet and, and Melanie and Prissy and the baby, that shot of them coming through the landscape that's been destroyed by battles and they're all the, the, the headstones and, and crosses of, I'm sure, very shallow graves. It's not red in the backdrop, but a sort of early morning, um, uneasy yellow, misty yellow with, uh, with the carriage um, silhouetted in black against that backdrop. It just reminds me of German romantic painting. Like, I, I wonder if it, they were directly influenced by the Abbey in the Oakwood, which is painting by Caspar David Friedrich, which is just very, very similar and very, very evocative. So there are different shots in the film that, that seem to be referencing famous paintings or, or informed by them at any rate. And it's just truly one of the most beautiful, I think, and very carefully visually constructed. I, I'm sure our, our listeners are familiar with a lot of um, backstory around the making of the film and, and how they actually had to paint in um, certain, certain elements of certain shots. So they would, they would take the, the film and they would have something where maybe in the background, they wanted a grand house, like say 12 Oaks. And they had physically shot all the stuff that they needed in the foreground but the background was like culver city you know so they would put one sort of half of a frame on top of what they had shot by painting in a beautiful house and sort of splice the two together and did other various tricks to sort of hide the fact that they were filming on a back lot uh, because it really does look in many instances like it's been filmed on location, right? which is pretty rare at that time. And obviously it wasn't, but they, they really uh, did a great job of disguising that fact and making you feel as though you're in Georgia. Right. The burning of the Atlanta Depot, right? That's the burning of a lot of different movie sets right. on, on lot that needed to be gotten rid of. Right. Yeah. The King Kong doors are that, that big structure that comes tumbling down in that one magnificent yeah, shot. That is beautiful. And you, you watch the movie and you wonder how they did that at the time. You wonder how they accomplished some of these things because the, the special effects seemed quite good. And then, and then yeah, it was, it was interesting to read. Culver City Fire Department had a lot of phone calls that night. <laughs> right. Right. I saw that. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned the Ebert review which mm -hmm. i did read so this is called it's just called gone with the wind i guess so here's the part I, I had actually remembered and highlighted this part that you mentioned about scarlet as a creature of the 1930s so here's the way he put it but the story it wanted to tell it was the right film at the right time scarlet o'hara is not a creature of the 1860s but of the 1930s a free-spirited willful modern woman 
The way was prepared for her by the flappers of Fitzgerald's jazz age, by the bold movie actresses of the period, and by the economic reality of the Depression, which for the first time put lots of women to work outside their homes. Scarlett's lusts and headstrong passions have little to do with myths of delicate southern flowers and everything to do with the sex symbols of the movies that shaped her creator, Margaret Mitchell. Actresses like Clara Bow, Jean Harlow, Louise Brooks, and Mae West. The way Scarlett is represented as a protagonist is is really important and and read as well as her antagonist slash <laughs> lover, uh, which is that it, it's in direct conflict with her environment, with the old South. Yeah, I don't think it's any more an- anachronistic than the strong women of, say, a Pride and Prejudice novel. Or I agree. Strong women of a Jane Austen novel are anachronistic. But she is not simply the Southern Belle in the way in which a lot of other women in the movie fulfill that role to one degree or another because they are interested in propriety right so she stands out she's she's an exception and this gets us back to the question of whether it's actually glorifying the old south so to me the the movie feels from the beginning like a satire you have scarlet fiddle dd war 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 (laughs) right to her the (laughs) the war is silly and quickly we get the same sort of attitude from red butler and a lot of contempt for the impracticality and dream dreaminess and foolishness of the south and the southern cause so glorification is really the the last thing that comes to mind when you when you jump into the movie i totally agree and i think that what the movie is doing is just extremely subtle so i think in the in the first half of the film what i find really striking is how arrogant the South is and how infantile the the South is about itself. I think it does that in in several ways in the first half of the film. I think where the critique breaks down is because the film doesn't follow through with that in the second half of the story. It doesn't maybe recognize the subsequent hypocrisy that the South shows by painting themselves as victims in Mm -hmm. the aftermath of the war. So you have these people literally asking for it, <laughs> um, getting themselves into into a war that they can't win. And then in the second half of the film, when you see the aftermath, there's no recognition. There's maybe a little hint of recognition from Ashley, but otherwise no real recognition that um, they are not the sort of blameless victims suffering from a defeat that has been completely unjust and and which has, you know, taken away their lives from them. So there's no there's no like recognition in the second half of the film, I think. To that extent, I understand people's problems with the film. I also understand people's problems with the way that the slaves are portrayed and and a few other things. Though I think that the best character in the film and the most moral character in the film is Mammy. Mm-hmm. She really is kind of the moral center and probably the smartest person in the film, of course, you can argue that that's canceled out by other characters, especially Prissy, though I think that also Prissy is a, is a little bit more um, intelligent than I think the, the movie may be implying that she's a little bit subversive. Right. I think that people have a certain idea about this film, and if they actually see it, they may be pleasantly surprised. I think especially compared to, and we can, sorry, get into the minutia, but I think especially compared to other films of this era with black characters, this film is far more nuanced in its portrayals than Mm -hmm. other films of the period. And therefore I sometimes feel as though despite the subject matter and the fact that it directly is reckoning with the, our country's past and history of slavery and all of these things, I think at the same time compared to other films of the time period, it's sort of an odd target for that kind of criticism because unfortunately I've seen other films that are just pure, stereotypes of black mm. of black characters really disgusting stuff that i don't care to watch so i think that this film has the you know the name recognition and the fact that it directly deals with the history but i think that people would be surprised and maybe not surprised in other ways if they gave the film a watching and and saw the critiques of the white characters embedded in so much of the film yeah 
you know, what we get with the text as we as we fade into the movie, there was a land of cavaliers and cotton fields called the Old South. Here in this patrician world, the age of chivalry took its last bow. Here was the last ever to be seen of knights and their ladies fair, of master and slave. Look for it only in books, for it is no more than a dream remembered, a civilization gone with the wind. That account that we begin with seems to buy into the Old South as a romantic ideal, and then we immediately get what I'm, I have called the satirical element, which is we get the twin brothers who have been expelled from college and Scarlet's contempt for the war. And we get the sense that the lifestyle that, and there are lots of things that happen in the movie to indicate this, but the, the lifestyle that they've built for themselves, which of course is predicated on slave labor and also their own, their own kind of in, indolence. And the fact that they spend all their, all, all their time is basically leisure time. So they're horseback riding or, you know, maybe they're getting an education of some kind. Um, but, you know, if you drop out of school, it's not a big deal. It's kind of impractical. The two most prominent representatives of the Old South are, are Melanie and Ashley. Mm-hmm. And there are those are ambivalent characterizations, I think. So there's a lot of there's a lot to like, especially about Melanie. But Ashley himself is supposed to come across as weak and entranced with a with this past lifestyle that's now that's now gone and he's been stringing along you you really don't you really wonder what's happened between him and scarlet you know he says she she cut her teeth on his heart something like that right Mm -hmm. and but obviously he's he's kind of strung her along so his his softness and gentility are not without their without their dark side and nor is nor is melanie's you know desire to see nothing but good in people and ironically to admire scarlet for being the very opposite <laughs> which which in her mind is you know passionate and and stubborn but really really ultimately amoral so anyway those are those are a few of the ways in which we get a that title card that we begin with very obviously can't be taken at face value which is not to say there isn't anything glorifying in it in a way it's there's an aesthetic glorification but that's undercut at every every point as far as um you know the glorification of the of the substance of it so some of Rhett's comments sort of recapitulate that title card but they're much harsher you know look at take a good look this is a you're going to watch the old south disappear overnight something like that and almost seeming to relish that yeah I, i agree and i completely agree with everything you're saying particularly melanie's delusions about Scarlet I find really interesting and and we can talk more about the nature of that later and whether or not it's a to what extent it's a willful delusion and how that might tie into the old Mm. south I think that Ashley is I've always because of um the charms of of Scarlet defended her wholeheartedly and I I do believe that she is the hero of this of this film no matter how bad she is somehow the, the worse she is the better I like her you know, the, the older I've gotten, the more I, I see Ashley as the villain. I do agree that he, he is a kind of a representative of the Old South. So we have this confrontation early on in the film between Rhett Butler and Charles Hamilton. It takes place as the men are sipping their, their brandy in, uh, in the study or the lounge or whatever it is, while Miss Scarlet with a revolver is in the hall. No, the ladies <laughs> have gone... <laughs> The ladies have gone for their their mid-afternoon nap, and this is another indication that things in the Old South are not um, not quite so great for the people involved, and that this is a very infantilizing and oppressive culture. And I think it's symbolically significant that Scarlet stays awake during the time that the rest of the women are sleeping. But anyway, the, the men are having this argument about the war, and... Ashley is is sort of being neutral about things and and trying to quiet Charles Hamilton, this very young, very immature guy who is trying to assert the power and glory of the South and and what it means to be a gentleman in the, in the face of Rhett Butler by launching ad hominem attacks against him when Rhett is trying to bring up the very real uh, disadvantages that the South would have to reckon with in a potential war with the North. And trying to start a duel with him. Yeah. And, and she would certainly lose. But <laughs> Right. Right. And uh, as, as Ashley says, and, and Rhett walks away rather than engage with Charles because Charles is so, so young and so ridiculous in this exchange that Rhett doesn't even take him seriously. But this is where we get Rhett's 
opinion about about the war for the first time. And I think it's important to note that this is Clark Gable talking. So if you want to know what the movie thinks that the audience should think right. about about the South, it's whatever Clark Gable says. And Red is is generous to this kid and really makes him look like a loser. And uh, meanwhile, Ashley is sort of this shadowy figure in the background, sort of advising Charles to not be mean to Red and to um, calm himself down. But we see that Ashley is very entrenched in this culture. He understands all of Rhett's points, but doesn't act on them or feel as though this is any real problem that we recognize. Later, we we know that he's taken in all of these criticisms of the South and understands them quite well. But he's extremely comfortable at Twelve Oaks. I think at one point he says that had the war never happened, he would have been happily buried at Twelve Oaks. I think he uses Mm -hmm. the term buried. Mm -hmm. And one wonders if he means buried in the life of Twelve Oaks and sort of buried alive, or Mm. if he means that he would have lived to be buried in the plantation plot. Um, (laughs) But I think it means both things. So we have all these things converging by the time of this confrontation scene. We have the fact that the women have been sent up to take a nap. We have Gerald O'Hara at Tara being completely oblivious to everything that's going on on the plantation. Um, he even has to h- hire Jonas Wilkerson, a white field overseer, to actually run the plantation for him. So he does, he's not even, you know, in addition to being sustained by slave labor, he isn't even actively engaged in directing that labor or understanding what's going on in the fields, in the house. His wife is a kind of a prototype for Scarlett. Uh, she is the one who seems to be taking care of things, though she's taking care of other people outside the house and doesn't understand what her own daughters are doing. We have this little upstart who tries to engage Rhett in a duel over um, these pie in the sky ideals. And we have Ashley who just sort of shrugs his shoulders and tells Charles to cool it. So uh, none of these men are particularly strong, nor are they particularly capable at what they do. And many of them are kind of idiotic. It's not a flattering portrait. Yeah. I mean, I think there is some ambivalence in the in the representation. Maybe I feel the need to defend the South. <laughs> oh, that's right. Because you are from... From your Connecticut aggression. Because I am from Savannah, Georgia, which... I know. I'm a Yankee. I clapped when she mentioned Savannah in the film, even though she didn't want to go. <laughs> There's nothing to do down there. <laughs> Seems like it would be more fun than Atlanta, but... Yeah. <laughs> But yes, yeah, so, you know, I read it as ambivalence towards the fantasy element of that lifestyle and genteel values, genteel virtues, but the way in which those things are predicated on, not just on certain forms of oppression, but on, you know, what people today would call privilege as a, as a kind of obliviousness, you know, which is what you were getting at. The failure to see what's around them, the fail to look things in the eyes. I think that's the way... This is what Red says at one point to Scarlet. Both of us are selfish and shrewd, able to look things in the eyes and call them by the right names. Mm. So this is meant to be the contrast between them and the environment they find themselves in, which they stick out. They both stick out like sore thumbs and, and so are made for each other in that sense, despite the fact that Scarlet What's odd is, you know, she's, you, you might call her a Southern belle, but she's not in the same sense that the other women, she's just using that. And she, she wants Ashley, but in a way she can admire his gentility, but in a way as a possession, right? It's not that she shares those values like Melanie. She wants what she wants and she's, um, as Red puts it, selfish and, and shrewd about it. So those two stick out like sore thumbs and, and in and of themselves amount to a critique of everything that's of the impracticality and the dreaminess of everything that's going on around them. They're obviously very imperfect themselves. And I can't say I, I have a huge amount of fondness for either of them. Really? (laughs) Yeah. I think Rhett, you know, he's, I I think he's the, I I do. There are some very likable aspects to him. I wonder if Han Solo is sort of modeled on him. I think so. Because he's a blockade runner and rebel and, and he has that same, Hey, I'm just self-interested, but in the end, he, he ends up fighting for the South out of some sense of shame and some sense of loyalty. So he's more complicated than, than just someone who's, who's selfish and nihilistic. And you have to believe that there's an ethical component 
to how he feels about the South, which was not, by the way, this is not simply fictional. I mean, even Robert E. Lee, right, had contempt for slavery and in a way for the Southern cause, but felt compelled right. to fight for the South. And it's very, you know, it's documented in, um, I think, his letters. But mm-hmm. So these are two different components to life, the sort of the gentility approach and the hard-nosed practicality approach. They both have their virtues and then uh, they they both of course have a lot of vices when taken to their extremes and the movie's characters aren't simplistic so even even scarlet is not a just simplistic representation of selfishness although i think she is very unlikable and, and selfish but she you know and at the point where she's forced to take care of melanie because she's made a promise to ashley there's a transformation there but it's not an unrealistic and it's not permanent so there's a kind of realism to her representation. She's not without a conscience in the end. She is capable of taking care of other people when she has to. And, and she is enamored of people, at least Ashley at first. And I think you know, she comes to love Melanie. She's enamored of people who put her in the position of having to care for others you know so in the case of you know ashley says please take care of melanie and she feels impelled to do that is not going to flee atlanta um, but it's going to stay and help melanie give birth and then at the end of the movie melanie makes her has her agreed to a similar sort of promise to take care of ashley after which her relationship to ashley and her love you know her obsession romantic obsession with him suddenly disappears so what I'm trying to say is that there's a complexity to the characters that reflects an ambivalent critique of any given different position taken to an extreme, and it recognizes the virtues of those positions as well. So it's not glorification. It's not demonization. I, I agree with you to a certain extent. I First of all, I think I seriously overestimated the the hold that i thought scarlet's charms would have over you <laughs> <laughs> she's a i mean she's delightful just just even you, you could watch the film with the sound turned off and just oh, just know. watching vivian lee's the expressions flit across her face the raised eyebrow of annoyance and the the depth of her her passion and desire that's really what scarlet is about and that's that's a winning feature but i do think She's not a nice person. <laughs> but go well, ahead. Sorry. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen a more beautiful woman captured mm. on, on film, like specifically in this film. You know, she's just, I don't know. She's so unbelievably beautiful, even when she's supposed to be ragged looking and covered in dirt. It somehow highlights it even more. It's truly uncanny. So you, you would, you don't think Grace Kelly is more... I'm just kidding. Sorry. No, no. <laughs> it's I funny. Because I know how much you hate her. That's what my mom said to me the other day. She's like, I still think <laughs> really? that Grace Kelly is more beautiful. And I was, I you oh, know, man. Oh. cut to a shot of the outside of my house with the, my screams ringing through the woods. Um, but <laughs> uh, sorry to get to the meat of what you're saying. Okay. So I, I agree with you to a certain extent. On another level, I think that there is a clear hierarchy of value in terms of be living in reality versus living in this fantasy gentility. I do think that one is superior to the other, at least according to the parameters of this film. I think that for Old South, one can substitute a kind of a childhood fantasy and that certain characters' preoccupations with this fantasy, it's not morally equivalent to the reality, the hard reality that, that Rhett represents, though he has, I think, other flaws. And, and therefore, I think you're right to say that these, these two portraits, neither is particularly flattering. I think if Rhett has a virtue, it's the fact that he is the grown-up. Yeah. Ashley says at one point that he would have freed the slaves once he took control of Twelve Oaks. And he was... This was something that he wanted to do and that he talked to his father about, yada, yada. Yeah, he's objecting to Scarlett using prison labor. And she's like, what about the slaves? And he said, I, well, we didn't treat them poorly, like the prison labor is being treated. And also I was going to free them. Yeah, Right. It's important to remember, I think, that at the beginning of the film, Scarlett is supposed to be 16. Ashley is a great deal older. So I think that's where that dynamic comes in, where he must have known her as a, a baby or a toddler or something, which is a little... Creepy if you think about it too hard. <laughs> Leslie Howard was aged down or, or tried, they tried to age him down and make him look a little bit younger so that he had that slight matinee idol kind of freshness at the beginning and then became more careworn 
as the movie uh, went on. Yeah, they couldn't get rid of the Englishness, though. No, but it's perfect. It's perfect. <laughs> I see. You just wonder, well, why is this English guy <laughs> in a Southerner? This is why it. it I think so many um, English people have played Southerners so well because mm-hmm. they, they do say that linguistically, or or whatever the term is, in terms of accents, it's very easy for um, an English person to do a Southern accent, easier than mm-hmm. to do a, whatever you would call a Northern accent Mm -hmm. a a non-accent um standard american whatever but uh ashley's saying that about about the fact that he would have freed the slaves whatever i mean he's a grown man and he acts as though like this is what i would have done when i grew up of course based on what we know about ashley's character we could safely assume that that would never happen because it would require him actually making a decision and following through on it there seems to be a, a clear connection between the realm of childhood fantasy and this idea of the old south or this desire to stay in one's one's comfort zone, one's bubble, one's delusions about the safety and security of, of childhood. Because I, I'm assuming that for many people who have only pure, uh, you know, uh, fantastic memories of childhood, it's in hindsight and they are forgetting many of the realities and the the harsher truths about how they were feeling at the time and how difficult it was to be a kid and. And so it seems as though everyone who glorifies the Old South in this film is glorifying a way of being that absolves them of responsibility and that requires, as you as you said at the beginning, no real effort on their part. It's a society built on the backs of other people, and it allows them to stay in this extremely uh, comfortable and unchallenging way of life in which they can sort of just coast until they die. So I think that Rhett's sense of reality is a virtue compared to that though though the characters have other strengths and and weaknesses and other other flaws and ultimately i think that's sort of what the movie is arguing that red is correct and that that scarlet as modern as she is and as um realistic and strong as she is what this childhood fantasy represents for her is ashley who as you pointed out and, and i agree is Uh, kind of a symbol of the Old South. Her obsession with him, I think, goes back to something elemental in her her upbringing and her sense of security at Tara. All of this is wrapped up in this obsession with Ashley. And so long as she is preoccupied with him, um, she's not really a grown-up in the way that Rhett keeps on demanding that she be. And she can remain childish to a certain extent so long as she loves Ashley. Mm -hmm. I think ultimately the draw of this fantasy becomes something that Rhett actually succumbs to. Ultimately, he retreats because he wants to, he can't take Scarlet anymore and he wants to go to a place where there's still some semblance of grace and charm, he says. So he's lived in reality for too long and uh, he can't take the heaviness of Scarlet's reality anymore. So ultimately, he kind of succumbs, maybe not to the Old South, but to some sort of idea of fantasy retreat, not having to deal with the harshness of the world. But I think that different characters are they're at different degrees of preoccupation with this idea of whatever fantasy the Old South represents. So I don't have as strictly a negative view of those ideals. So for instance, it's, you know, the South in a way is representative of aristocratic virtues, which are necessarily sort of predicated on oppression. So the aristocratic virtues are all in a way about the celebration of power and the leisure that comes from it and the celebration of class distinction and the kinds of mannerisms and dress that illustrate class distinction. It's a way of life built on that kind of evil, but that doesn't mean that that way of life is, is entirely without its, its virtues. It's a celebration of excellence, right? It's the kind of thing that Aristotle might have pointed to in some ways as a model for good living in its purity now now in reality you know even if you're looking at english landed gentry right the the reality is always much different than the ideal and it's even more degraded in the south because in a way it's it's like new money versus old people but it's it's country people playing at being landed gentry um we discussed some of this in the streetcar named desire episode they're playing at being landed landed gentry and they're doing that by use of slavery so in a way it's a kind of pantomime it's not even real 
you know, what you've described is, is clear, the represent the extent to which it's a kind of fantasy. And I think, again, that title card makes it clear. They're the land of cavaliers and cotton fields of the old South. That sort of romanticization is being made fun of, and that sort of romanticization is built into the self-concept, right, of the people involved in it, including Ashley. Mm-hmm. It, you know, including even Melanie to some point, although she is much more motivated on a personal level by by love and by the desire to take care of people. I don't think she's... She, she's not into the lifestyle per se. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Think of this as a lifestyle. Ashley is into the lifestyle. Scarlett is not so much into the lifestyle as she is into making use of it to get what she wants. And there are certain aspects of it which suit what she wants. So, for instance, dressing up or acting like she's genteel, saying, you know, you so no gentleman or whatever. Mm-hmm. She's playing the part there. And it's not because she buys into the lifestyle or is into it. It just, it suits her uh, quest to get what she wants. But someone like Ashley, right? He's bought into it. And someone like Red is uh, completely contemptuous of it. I think the whole scene that really gets things moving is that scene right with the Ashley and and Scarlet I mean, you know Scarlet after having escaped her nap and we we've overheard overheard some overheard huh? <laughs> overheard some of the uh the war talk with the men she you know she pulls Ashley aside in that room and she is being very passionate and he's being romantic but fatalistic you know you, you know you've you've gathered every other man's heart today you always had mine you cut your teeth on it and she accuses of him him of leading her on and um slaps him and that's his cue to leave and then she throws the vase and breaks it and then there's that wonderful moment well throws the vase and then has that annoyed raised single eyebrow look that i think is so great yeah. but and then there's that great moment when we hear Rhett whistle, right? And he he leans up from the couch, you know, to So we are immediately in the position of Rhett as spectators at that point. So if there's any confusion about the satirical nature of the film, it's the fact that this very romantic soap opera moment has unfolded in front of someone who uh, is so contemptuous of its of its falsity, right? And says has the war started? <laughs> mm. Which is a great line, you know, because of the throwing of the vase and, and associates the war with love and, and relationships through through the rest of the film. And in a way, love is war for Scarlet. And that's the type of war that she takes seriously, not the kind of war that all the all the men take seriously. And she's, you know, says you should have made you should have made your presence known and as Red puts it, in the middle of that beautiful love scene. Mm-hmm. So he's providing ironic containment there to a scene that by itself, if it took itself completely seriously, would be absurd. The movie couldn't survive without being ridiculous by simply uh, stringing the, those sorts of scenes together. And there's already an absurdity, right, in the fact that Scarlett and Ashley are at such cross purposes in that scene where he is, um, they're not speaking the same language. He's speaking the language of gallantry which in that context is obtuse because he's leading her on and he seems determined fatalistically, you know, determined to, to reject Scarlet in a way where, where, you know, he's not giving her the impression that, okay, you're, you're just, you're not a nice person and I need a nice person. He's saying to her, I love you, but, but what? It's hard to know exactly what he's saying. So there's a fun (laughs) or satirical asymmetry between them. And then, uh, and then Rhett sort of, uh, completes that and ultimately will say you know this the, ashley is not good enough for a girl with your passion for living mm-hmm. so we were saying before about you know the idea of being kind of practical and clear-eyed but it also pits this sort of passion for living against whatever sort of living is involved in living out this genteel fantasy in which right a lot of gentility means you know the curtailment of one's of one's passions. So yeah, just to push back once more against your reading of Ashley a little bit, though I, you know, I I do agree with you, but sort of by matter of degrees, I do think that in this scene, what you call gallantry is actually a false gallantry. So if he was really gallant, if he was really a quote unquote man or, or an adult, um, he would not be leading her on like this. And he says things like, you know, why do you make me say things that hurt you? Yeah. Yeah. I I was basically, I was trying, I was trying to say that. Yeah. Right. Um, He's speaking that language, but it's, yeah, it's, it's hurtful. 
there's a a sense in which he's he's dragged along by whatever current he's in. You know, he even thinks that he might go to New York and and make his living up there in the hopes of finally standing on his own two feet and not relying on Scarlett. But this idea that this 16 year old girl is is forcing him to say things that he doesn't want to say. I mean, he's just this is incredibly cruel in a way. I mean, he he's never honest with her and just says things outright or even in a way that she's capable of understanding without nuance. And her pursuit of him really does kind of flip the traditional gender roles. I mean, he is, he is leading her on um, and mm-hmm, he is mm-hmm. playing the role of a coquette <laughs> to a certain extent, or, or at least of a, a reticent female while she pursues him sort of voraciously throughout the film. I do think that there is a, a theme, even when it comes to Mr. And Mrs. O'Hara of sort of, emasculated men or men who, and I know that I know that this, this connects to gentility and what you've been talking about rather well with aristocratic values, but there's something about the slave doing the work for you and the lack of engagement with the reality of what goes on, which is, first of all, I think allowing these characters to romanticize this in their own minds. And Mm -hmm. second of all, which is, taking away i don't want to say feminizing because it's too that, that's too gendered but divorcing them to the degree that they could be as shy and retiring and disengaged as the traditional southern bell would be um forcing the women often to fill the void of the person in charge or the person who sort of directs as as women often do in courting situations where a woman is, you know, in in relationships with with men is often far more in control than one might think. Or traditionally, you know, there are all these stereotypes about women have to sort of manipulate men into proposing to them. You know, women have always held a tremendous amount of power in that in that relationship. But here, the power is very naked, and the shy and retiring elements of of Ashley are, I think, very sinister. Yeah, I agree. There's a sinister element. I, I mean, I actually think it's kind of there's a kind of comedy skit element to that scene. That's what I was trying to get at by saying that they're speaking different languages. It's, it's as if you took Ashley and it could be a Saturday night live skit where you, you, he's time traveled, right? And he's, he's trying to function in the contemporary scene that we're familiar with. You know, he's trying to speak the language of gentility to someone who's trying to speak a different language. And it's funny in a way because, uh, you know, he's caught up in his own little dream world and doesn't see what's going on around him so yeah you know technically scarlet is the one who's kind of out of place there but scarlet is closer to us in the in a sense right because she's not speaking that fantasy language entirely she's she's more practical and more focused on on reality so we identify with that and it's 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 ashley that feels out of place and and again rhett sort of brings that home Mm. well and this i think brings us to melanie who I really like also when Scarlett leaves the library and is hiding under the stairs as the women come down after their nap. And we we realize maybe for the first time, though we've gotten hints of this when Melanie was introduced to Scarlett, that Melanie is reading Scarlett in a very different way from the other women of Scarlett's acquaintance, none of whom like her, including her own sisters. She's just high-spirited and vivacious. <laughs> right, right. Well, and and we get a sense, too, that Melanie's reading of her, though though extremely generous at times, is often accurate and maybe more accurate than we realize, or and certainly more accurate than Scarlett realizes. So, for instance, India Wilkes, Ashley's sister, who is really not a sympathetic character. So we're given a lot of these rivals of Scarlet and they are so unsympathetic that it really makes us, at least for me, it makes me... Well, why is she not sympathetic? She's harsh. She has no personal charm. I think we're not, we're not supposed to find her sympathetic. She advises or tries to advise Melanie not to trust Rhett Butler when he's trying to save the men from the mm-hmm. situation that they've gotten themselves into. And, and I think that kind of shows what we're supposed to think of her. You know, how dare she not trust Clark Gable? She's a little uh, viperish, and we do get the sense that she's very jealous of Scarlet, I think, and rightfully so. She's speaking badly about Scarlet, and certainly Scarlet deserves it, but she's saying things that are just uh, demonstrably untrue. She accuses Scarlet of, of making a fool out of herself by running after all the men at the barbecue. That's just not true. The men, Melanie says she's, she's so attractive, the men just naturally flock to her, and that is 
true. Well, she is and she isn't. You know, she's not really throwing herself at, but she's using men. She's she's manipulating men and getting their attention. And right. I, I think that Melanie is more right than India is. And I guess what I'm interested in is whether or not Melanie's overly generous readings of everything that Scarlett does, if those readings are actually always accurate on a certain level. I think they're they're diluted and they're accurate at the same time, which is right. what makes them so interesting. Yeah. Right, right. She seems completely naive to Scarlet's the flaws of Scarlet's character. And yet what she's really she she's focused on things that are real and that's just what Melanie focuses on the good things in people and the, the, the ways in which they're good. And when she ignores the rest of it, you get the sense that that is an ethical choice for her, that, that she's decided to do that. And she understands that she's doing that at some level. No, I agree. And, and um, I think you can even argue, I mean, there's a reading of this where Melanie is just trolling Scarlet throughout the entire <laughs> movie, you know, that, that she knows all along and is just sort of like getting the better of Scarlet. Well, she's trolling her into being a better person. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Or or how, how much Melanie understands about Ashley and Scarlett's relationship is, of course, open to questioning. And when Scarlett marries Charles, for instance, and Melanie comes over to her and says, you know, we thought of you during our wedding the day before or whatever. You kind of wonder, like, what is she's being kind on the one hand, but she uh, she has to know. And it's almost like she's she's flaunting the fact of her marriage to Ashley the day before, right to Scarlett in order to get her goat in a way. I don't know. There are certain things that she does at that moment and a couple of other moments in the film where I, I question her motivations. And I think that's kind of what makes her so so interesting in a way. I mean, I don't think that the Melanie is is being portrayed as a troll to any degree, but I do think that Olivia de Havilland is really smart about the way that she's she's playing this character as being way more complex. And you suggested that Olivia de Havilland's performance is the strongest, you think? Yeah, I do think she, her performance is the best. De Havilland's role is a harder thing to pull off. It's easier to be mischievous and um, irate and uh, dissatisfied than it is to pull off that kind of selfless, loving kind of person to give that feeling, right? It's not going to come out in the dialogue necessarily. It does a little bit, but it's a vibe, you know, and I don't think it's just the actress's character. Apparently she wasn't really like that. So no, no, I think a few people are, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the things I'm curious about in the film is what it is that Scarlett actually wants. We know she's passionate, but we don't get a clear idea of why she's passionate about Ashley in particular, for instance. And I, I don't think it's, it's not about status. It's not about wanting what she can have that doesn't have, seem to have a lot of pull with her actually with rent. The way I put it before is that she, her relationship to this, the, her genteel environment, you know, like, like rent, they are sort of outside it in a sense, but in the figure of Ashley, it's in a way, it's almost like she wants to possess it. Or, or maybe it's more inexplicable than, than that. It's just she wants what she wants, and she got the idea that she wanted Ashley, and therefore that's it. That's what she wants, and nothing else is gonna nothing else is gonna do. I think you're right. I, I think there's a strange and very deeply buried strain of self criticism in Scarlet. I think Ashley represents an ideal for her, also expressed in her mother, and this is something that I also remember in the book being. Um, much more fleshed out, which is the mother was always very calm and very genteel. And, and you get this in the, mm. the very brief glimpses that you get of Barbara O'Neill. Very unlike Scarlet. Very much so. Uh, yet at the same time serving, uh, as I, I think I suggested before, as a kind of a prototype for the, the girl boss taking care of, of things and, um, mm -hmm. and, and being very self-sufficient and capable, unlike many of the other women of the era, I guess. I think that that desire to be good sets up this conflict with Melanie because this is why Scarlett hates Melanie so much and of course also loves her in a weird way. I think it's it's what makes her want to have Ashley because that would give her um, the satisfaction or sort of reassure her maybe of of some sort of goodness in herself and some idea that she is actually a, a proper even, uh, you know, moral, virtuous, um, genteel lady. But I think that her self-hatred, if you will, comes out in the fact that she knows that she can't have Ashley 
and she only wants what she can't have. And it's a kind of a built in punishment for herself. And I, I, of course, know a lot of background information, both about the film and about all the all the real life actors. And one really interesting element that I, I remember reading about a while ago when Vivian Lee's letters to Laurence Olivier were made public. They were bought by the Victorian Albert Museum, I think. She, of course, was having an affair with Olivier during the filming of Gone with the Wind. And he was uh, he had just finished filming Wuthering Heights. I think there was some overlap. But the two were kept apart in Hollywood because they didn't want any scandal attached to Vivian Lee by living with this guy while he was married to someone else and she was married to someone else. Um, so they had to communicate through letters and he had to give her support and advice through these letters. And in one of them, I remember he he wrote something to the effect of, you know, you do realize that the only thing that makes possible Scarlett's admission of love for Rhett at the end of the film is because she knows that she's lost him. Hmm. So on, on some level, she knows that she's pushed him too far. And that is what allows her to finally see Ashley's flaws and open up to Rhett once she's become an object of, uh, of rejection for Rhett. So uh, there, there must be something there. I mean, there must be, she continually pushes it down and, and, and buries this self-critical reflex in her, uh, right? P- pushing it off until tomorrow, not dealing with it. And that makes her a survivor, of course, and it makes her capable of overcoming obstacles better than anyone else. Uh, Because she doesn't get distracted by morality, (laughs) self-criticism, questioning her own her own motives, questioning anything that she's doing to succeed. But it does come out, I think, ultimately in um, a kind of an essential dissatisfaction with whatever her state is, maybe assuming that she's not lovable. I don't know. Um, I don't want to go too far here, but uh, I don't know what you think about that. So you're you're suggesting that her obsession with Ashley has something to do with on the one hand, not yet when it wanting what she can have in part because she is masochistic. Mm-hmm. She doesn't feel as though she's worthy of it. Yeah. I don't know. I didn't, I was trying to suggest that it wasn't simply that she couldn't have him. Although I think that is the more plausible in a way interpretation that she wants what she can't have. It's, it's much more plausible, but I was, I was entertaining the idea that it was more inexplicable than that. And therefore I can't explain it. <laughs> Uh, no, I know what you mean. I yeah, that, I agree with you. I think I think it is more mysterious than I'm making out, and I think any effort to play psychiatrist, well, just just inexplicable in the sense that you know it, it has something to do with her relationship to gentility, and and therefore it's a her obsession with Ashley is in some way right a comment on on the fascination with that fantasy although as I've said she's not within it, so her love of Ashley is not it's not that she shares those values in a way but it's more of a fascination with it from the outside Mm. and again i think the idea that she wants what she can't have is much more plausible in a way and it's consistent with her with her character and um her her sense of pride and and all of that so what i'm saying is it's kind of i'm trying to give it some thematic heft which which may be a bridge too far well i think that that works really well thematically and i i think that this childishness and this this ambivalence in her is, is part of this larger structure that we've been talking about. I, I think to a certain extent, the self-criticism is true for Rhett also. Why does Rhett like Scarlet? One can argue that he likes her because he can't have her and doesn't like her when she does finally come around on him. Well, his theory is that they're kindred spirits, right? Right, right. I, I think there's a lot of things that they like about each other and even that Scarlet likes about him that she doesn't recognize. But I think that ultimately this butting of heads between them is because their I think his attraction to her is predicated on on her unavailability. Maybe he keeps wanting her to fully engage with him and to give up Ashley. I think at the same time, in the same way that he is intrigued by gentility and has these sort of warring warring elements within himself of this sympathy for the South, but a uh, you know a recognition of the reality of the situation. And we know that this is borne out by his background, right? He's from a a very genteel Charleston family. He is impressed by Melanie, though he says that genteel women uh, don't hold much charm for him or something Mm -hmm. like that. Ultimately, he does, as I said earlier, desire to retreat from Scarlett's harsh realities and, and go to find some place of grace and charm. So I think this push pull is very evident in red as well. Even the childishness 
of Scarlett and her intractability and her unwillingness to let go of Ashley is something that Rhett likes for some reason. I, and, and I think that to a certain degree, Rhett wants to baby Scarlett um, and likes what is childish in her, not in a creepy way or, or in a way that's wrong, not in the childish way that women are typically treated in the society, having to take naps and stuff like that. But I think he wants to do things for her and provide things for her. And, and we see this with Bonnie, where he can be a provider and a, a source of comfort for her. But that nurturing, that childishness comes with all of the bad things about, about Scarlett, which is her childish preoccupation with someone who is not Rhett. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if she had gotten this childish fantasy of Ashley out of her head, which is something that I think Rhett suggests to her in so many words um, early on when he comes with a bonnet or at some other point early on in the film. I don't know if completely eliminating that and becoming the woman that Rhett wants her to be would have made her less attractive in his eyes. And if, if somehow I, I'm, I'm trying to connect his sympathy for the South with her sympathy for Ashley and all of it being a kind of engagement in, in fantasy mm. in a way that is, that makes life and reality very difficult for people, even the people who we associate most, most closely with living in the quote unquote real world, as opposed to the old South world. I think that the childishness and the, the fatalism that, that you talk about in Ashley associated with the old South it's ultimately like the the undoing of all the major characters and there's even a kind of sterility ultimately in in what happens at, at the end right the children and life renewing itself as melanie says it ultimately kills her though scarlet has more children in the book she has a child with each of her three husbands those are cut out and it's just bonnie which i think works really well in the film mm. uh, bonnie of course dies doing Mr. O'Hara's favorite activity. And again, a kind of symbol of the aristocratic lifestyle um, that you talked about. The marriage is broken between Melanie and Ashley because of her death and the marriage of Red and Scarlet is broken up. And basically everybody just ends up being very, very unhappy and there doesn't seem to be a way forward. And I wonder if that's because of each of those four main characters' preoccupation with a fantasy and with an older way of life that can't be carried into the future. Even Scarlet, who is very modern in, in the way that she's made her money and, and the way that she lives, seems to be hobbled by that in the end. I don't mm. know if you'd agree with that. Yeah, so I think we see some of that preoccupation in Scarlet for the old ways that you were talking about with the significance of Tara to her. You know, this is obviously a theme that's that's repeated in the movie uh, in the explicit content of it, but also visually. So early on when we're being introduced to the, basically to Tara and to the parents and to that little schemer, Scarlet, <laughs> um, mm. we see her father riding and jumping and of course foreshadowing how he's going to die and how Bonnie's mm. going to die. But we also get that great scene where the father and daughter are silhouetted against the sky. And he says, Land is the only thing worth working for, fighting for, dying for, the only thing that lasts. Then she accuses him of talking like an Irishman. Very racist of her. Um, mm -hmm. That silhouetting against the sky is repeated at the end of the movie when she gives the famous speech, as God is my witness, I'll never be hungry again. If I have to lie, cheat, kill, steal, sorry, lie, steal, cheat, or kill. And then I think it, it happens again at the very end of the movie, right? When she realizes that Tara, in a way, is the is the way out, and she's hearing the voices of Ashley and others. You know, so Ashley himself has said that Tara is the one thing that's important to her, and she's going to deal with the loss of Rhett by going back to Tara. Although she's not going to give up, right? She's going to try and get him back because tomorrow is another day. <laughs> but Tara becomes the focal point again, and that becomes the thing that rejuvenates her this idea of the permanence of the land and the the land being a thing that's worth dying for or fighting for i don't know how that fits in exactly right because it's it's not per se an obsession with the old south or the lifestyle right because terra is transformed after the war it's not going to be a plantation with slaves it has been renovated with Rhett's help and all his money, but it's never going to be the same thing. And the land is never going to be the same thing exactly 
either. And yet it's supposed to be something that joins the past and the present and will survive the loss of the South and the loss of that way of life. And I don't know how that works thematically or how it fits with Scarlet's character in particular. I agree, because I think that Scarlet's mother represents one thing or a couple of things, as I've said, both a woman in charge and also a kind of ideal woman in terms of her behavior, while the father represents something wilder and more passionate. And that's that's the link to the land. It's these two forces joining together to create the character of the South in a way. And then it's never the same, as you say, mostly because there was a kind of a soiling that happened, not mm-hmm. not in terms of getting the actual soil tampered with, maybe, uh, to a certain extent, but because the Yankees used Terra as their headquarters, right? Mm-hmm. So Scarlett gets this real look of disgust on her face when she realizes that the Yankees have, have penetrated Terra and have, have used it, have, have soiled it, defiled it in some way by setting up camp there. It's a strange hybrid, as you say, because we have these slaves who have chosen to stay on and continue to work, some of them, and uh, continue to work for the family. So there's a kind of suspended animation going on at the house. And it's also... Which is very common uh, historically, mm. but yeah. And and there's also a sort of false perpetuation of, of the estate that's been enabled only by the wealth of, well, the, first the wealth that Scarlett amasses through Frank Kennedy's store and then through Brett uh, giving her the money to make it as, as grand a house as it ever was, as he says to her. So it's gotten this infusion of cash that we can imagine not many other estates have had. I mean, you know, 12 Oaks is completely, it's just the staircase at at a certain point. So I'm sure that uh, 12 Oaks was ultimately just knocked down in the Mm. universe of the film. You're helping me understand this actually, because this is one of Scarlett's strengths is that she's a very shrewd businesswoman and she seems to like to work. And uh, there's even an element in her that she seems to like to survive and maybe she likes to be down and out. And maybe that's the point of the infatuation with Ashley is that it puts her always into this mode of struggle. I mentioned before about, you know, her, her love relationships are actually her war, right? She likes to be at war in a way because she likes to be, to be active and the transformation of the land that's, that's happened is actually, you know, it's been transformed from something that the slaves are going to work and the, the leisurely upper class are going to live off of that work. It's been transformed into something that she can work herself, right? So she's losing Rhett. She's losing the person who sort of propped up the fantasy for her for, for a while by, you know, as you put it, infusing infusing cash into it. And, and she's imagining going back to the land. And it sounds like to actually to work, to turn Tara into an actual project and not just a project in which she's trying to make money is with the lumber business and Frank's store because she's fearful, right? Because she feels insecure and she thinks money is the only way to survive not in the sense and you know that the end of the first half in which it's about never being hungry again and lying and cheating and stealing but a much more completed and and more mature sense of what work means right and so she's coming to her own in that sense in which she can just embrace the land and and embrace Tara the estate for the sake of um becoming someone who's devoted to actual work and it kind of helps you see the demise of the old way of living of the old south as a, a liberation of the master from their the masters from their indolence or from their passivity or from you know the fantasy that we've talked about and uh yeah so i think um what you were saying brought that out that's really good it helps me understand more of what that that draw is for her and yeah i really like that i think that cycle of struggle and reward Mm. is something that has to be sustained for her too. So it it can't be too much struggle. She has to enjoy a certain reward out out of it. I mean, the happiest I think that we see her in the film is when she's on her honeymoon with Rhett and Mm -hmm. she gets to just totally (laughs) indulge herself. Eating desserts and... Yeah. Yeah, the look on her face when the dessert tray goes by, it's like a... It's almost like an Eliza Doolittle moment. Um, Yeah. (laughs) And and where she's, you know, she's just voraciously eating and, and... Rhett's like, don't scrape your plate. I'm sure they have more in the back. (laughs) (laughs) That it says a lot about me that I thought that was, uh, that was the best part of the movie. Um, yeah, like that was the, the height of luxury. Get to eat as much dessert as you want. But then that, that very quickly is punctured by the nightmare 
that she has of, you know, so mm-hmm. she's not able to enjoy the reward after a while, or if we can call this a reward, hopefully listeners will know what I mean by this. In other words, struggle and enjoyment. So she's not able to enjoy herself for long before this nightmare creeps back in. And what does she want to do but go back to Tara? So she's uncomfortable enjoying it for very long, which means that, I don't know, maybe there's no way that she could have had a satisfying marriage with Rhett. I mean, the honeymoon stuff seems seems pretty good to me. And they could, if they wanted, just be two people enjoying their largesse. And, and I mean, obviously, even the nightmare scene has a, a very sweet element of their relationship in it, in which he's comforting her yeah. because of the horrors that she's seen. But it seems like that enjoyment can only last so long for her before she has to go back to the struggle. Otherwise, she's not satisfied. And I think this might also be what makes her a bad mother or a disinterested mother, which is because there's no cycle involved there. Maybe, you know, raising a child is just, well, first of all, I I don't know how she would know how to be a good mother, seeing as her own mother didn't raise her. I mean, Mammy Mm. is her mother, but with none of the real... The power, the real... Yeah, without the power, exactly. Without the power that that it would actually take to rein Scarlet in and to raise her properly. So Mammy has sort of been defanged in the way that parents need to have fangs, (laughs) I mean, Mm -hmm. in order to properly raise their children. So Scarlet doesn't know how to be a mother, but it also, that kind of interest in a child implies a sort of a longer term struggle with little reward or enjoyment that Scarlett doesn't seem to know how to handle. It seems like she has to go through these real difficult trials and then and then get some sort of monetary compensation for them. And, yeah. uh, and a child just isn't the kind of project that she's interested in. So I don't know how long a relationship between Scarlett and Rhett could conceivably be sustained, even if Scarlett was into him from the beginning. I don't know what their future would look like if she were to win him back. And if the movie is saying that it's impossible for her to get him back, I don't know if, if that is, if his stance on this is permanent and he want, he wants nothing to do with her forever or what the movie seems to imply that what Scarlett wants, she gets ultimately sort of she never really gets Ashley. Yeah. I, I have a feeling they'll get back together. <laughs> they, they you do. Got, okay. Yes. Because they've done it before. And usually people do what they've done before. Hmm. Well, let me let me say a few things about that. You're talking about her, the dynamic of struggle and enjoyment. The, the struggle occurs within the context of the relationship and the enjoyment is kind of extraneous to it, right? So she enjoys the food. She enjoys being rich, right? On there, he's like, what are you thinking about? And she's like, how rich we are. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Um, and and before they get married, you know, they, they admit to each other, say, you're going to marry me. And she says, yes. And then is it because of my money? And she's, she's, it's a rare moment of honesty where she says, yes, partly <laughs> money does help. I'm fond of you. You know, you know, I'm lying if I said I was madly in love with you. And he says, I'm not in love with you any more than you are with me, which not true. turns out not to be true. Or, or maybe at that moment it's true, but obviously he's, he does love her at various points and and by the end of the movie totally and abjectly is in love with well, her. Well, Belle will describe it as being poisoned with her, which right, I think is pretty good. Right. Yeah, that is that is really good. As for her, what Melanie says at some point is that she's always been in love with you, she just doesn't know it. She says this to Red. Mm-hmm. And I think that idea occurs at a few points. Scarlett will say that at the end. She says, you know, I've loved you for years, something like I'm a stupid fool who didn't know it. So that that actually was one of the things that interested me. So I wanted to relate that to our our final question of whether they're going to get back together. But whether you can love someone without knowing it, because I think whether they're going to get back together sort of depends on this question. Is it really the case that she loved him without knowing it and now she realizes it? Or is that just a silly idea of hers? I'm inclined to actually believe it. Through the movie, I badly wanted that transformation of Scarlet, right? I wanted that climactic moment where she comes to see the error of her ways and grows up a little bit. And this seems to provide it, although there's there's ambiguity about whether it's real. And I think that ambiguity is related to the question of whether they will, will get back together. Can we love someone unconsciously and not know it and then realize it? I think yes, but I don't know if I can justify that. I think it's obvious, too, that she loves him without knowing it. And I think that the subterranean element of that is even a necessity for her. I don't think that she's capable of outwardly loving anyone or or mm-hmm. sort of that she has to sort of love someone against her own will because her actual 
means of, of loving people are so warped and thwarted in a way by her own selfishness or her own fantasies that it's not really possible for her to love someone properly. That's why I, I'm, I'm not sure about what that relationship with Rhett would look like once she loves someone and is conscious of it and then enters into a relationship. Because I don't, I don't know how, how she would be under those circumstances. We never see her express that love for someone in, in an actually, in a, in a healthy relationship. And we can argue that her relationship with Rhett was never healthy and that they recognize that, that he recognizes that. Another thing that always bothers me in the film are the, the, the miscommunications that arise between them. So even though, for instance, Ashley and, and Scarlett are not caught many times having romantic scenes with each other, India, I think it is, and, and Mrs. Mead see them embracing in the mill in an actually innocent moment and interpret that as being a, an, an affair that's going on. As Rhett says, you know, Ashley can't be faithful to his wife mentally, but won't be mm. unfaithful to her technically. Right. So, of right. course, what they're seeing is just some sort of reality, even if in that moment uh, it isn't real. Also, Rhett makes the same error of interpretation when Scarlett comes out of the room in which Melanie is dying and comforts Ashley. Right. Right. Um, and Ashley breaks down. But there have also been, of course, many miscommunications between Scarlett and Rhett when she's calling for him after she's miscarried and he doesn't know it and says later, if you had only wanted me, if you'd only called for me, and she says that she had. So I don't know why, but I feel as though this is fundamentally related to this question of whether or not they can be together because of the hidden nature of their love for each other to themselves, also because of this continual misinterpretation it seems important to me and, and the fact that the misinterpretation with ashley happens twice once by the sort of larger society and once by Rhett. i, mm -hmm. I think that's important too I, I don't know why that is but it seems to strike at the heart of the relationship dynamic being somehow permanently broken mm -hmm. i i as a kid always was so frustrated by those scenes because I would think, you know, they do love each other, but but as an adult, I realize that that inability to communicate that love means that there's something wrong there that probably can't be overcome. So they're never going to get back together. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I hope that they are. I mean, sometimes as a kid, I would be so upset over everything that happened that I would stop watching after the honeymoon scene <laughs> and oh, just yeah. imagine that they were happy together for for the rest of the movie uh, because uh, their breakup was so painful for me to watch sometimes. Wow. Yeah. You know, I didn't know where the, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn line came in the movie. And I kept looking for it, waiting for it, hoping that that was not the last line. <laughs> and it's not. Because <laughs> it was a very depressed, that would be a very depressing last line. And yeah, it's not. Mm -hmm. So they give you just enough hope. Tomorrow is another day. There is a sequel, right? that was written by someone else called Scarlet. Yeah. But that's supposed to be pretty terrible. I think, right. What they, they, I think they do get back together in that, right? Yeah. I'm assuming they would have to, but in order yeah, to, I mean, I'm assuming the the appetite for their reunion is what caused the thing to be written. Yes. But that's an alternate universe. <laughs> we don't yeah. know what happens in the real gone with the wind universe. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. But maybe, you know, this, this, um, her ultimate comeuppance or whatever you want to call it. We've been thinking that Ashley is the figure of the old South. Maybe it's Scarlet, you know, mm. and maybe this gesture at the end of tomorrow is another day is, is like saying the South will rise again. <laughs> it's you know, it's ultimately, uh, let's hope not. I, right. Right. It's ultimately foolish and hopeless and sad and sinister. I don't, I don't know. One thing that we haven't gotten to really that we've skimmed it are examinations of the black characters. I don't know if we want to cover that or, We've talked about Mammy, but I guess there's Prissy. We've kind of glossed over Prissy. And uh, uh, who's the house servant? Pork and Big Sam. You know, there's so much more to talk about with this movie because it is so big and so long and contains so many interesting characters. Some of it maybe we can get to in the postscript. So maybe that'll be a little teaser for our regular listeners. Yeah. But otherwise, I think now's a good place to end. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to everyone who listened to this episode. I just wanted to say that if you're listening to this on the feed for the Partial Examined Life, you're not yet subscribed. You should subscribe to us directly by searching for us on the podcast app of your choice. And if you like us, a rating or review would help a lot. 
You can also find us at subtextpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to our email newsletter. To get ad-free episodes and a variety of bonus content, please subscribe at patreon.com slash subtext. Bonus content will include our after show, which we're calling Postscript, which consists of an extra 15 minutes of discussion following the regular episode. Sometimes we'll continue talking about the topic for that week. Sometimes we'll discuss what else we've been reading, writing, and thinking about. When the time comes, we'll be responding to listener emails. And sometimes we'll talk a little bit about ourselves. Subscribing will also get you the occasional full bonus show and several prequel episodes that I did with various guests. Send your feedback and episode requests to letters at subtextpodcast.com. You'll also find us on Facebook at Subtext Podcast and on Twitter at Enjoy Subtext. And once again, thank you for listening. Thank you.